Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From our God and Father, through our Lord and Savior, transfigured on the Mount, Jesus Christ. Amen. I have to be honest, I was just a little bit jealous. See, my wife and I had just started dating, and it was that first spring together, and she was on the Bethany softball team, and every spring break, they would go down to Florida uh, for spring training. And she got to meet her personal hero. And that's all I heard about that week. She met number two from the Twins team, Denard Spann. He even signed her birthday card, and she got to take a picture with him. What would it be like to meet your personal hero? How would you feel to stand in their presence, get to ask them anything you wanted, get to talk to them? How awesome would that be? Well, today, we get to see uh, Peter, James, and John all stand in the glory of their three heroes, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And in a moment where any one of us would have been lost for words, Peter simply stumbles out these profound words, Lord, it's good to be here. Our lesson for our meditation today is recorded in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Please stand as we read as follows in Jesus' name. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. We bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, Thank you for showing us the glory of our Savior, Jesus. Thank you for revealing to us that he is not just an ordinary man, but he is true God, your Son, and our Savior. To this end, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Please be seated. There are times people refer to mountaintop experiences. And it's, it's no surprise because if, if you've been on a mountaintop before, and there's just that exhilarating feeling of looking down on the world and, and everything, all your problems just seem so small. But at the same time, when you're standing on top of the mountain, you just you see how immense and awesome and majestic the world is and God's creation is. So we have these these mountaintop experiences, and and oftentimes we'd say that nothing can really measure up to that in our life. And so it's neat where we have these moments that that we get this moment recorded for us by the disciples. They're actual, both both, uh, literal and 
and a metaphorical mountaintop experience when they see Jesus transfigured. But what's neat about those three heroes that appeared that day, Moses, Elijah, Jesus, each one of them has their own mountaintop experience that we're going to look at today that that helps us understand what's happening here on Transfiguration Sunday. So to begin with, we're going to look at, at Moses. Moses is the prophet that was probably the the closest to God. Out of all the prophets in the Bible, we're told that Moses was the one who spoke to God face to face as you or I would speak with a friend. Moses was the one that led the children of Israel out of Egypt to the base of Mount Sinai where they were going to meet the Lord in person. It is a terrifying moment. We're told that when the Lord came on to Mount Sinai, that the whole mountain trembled and shook. Lightning shot out. Thunder echoed down across the valley. The Lord descended in fire upon the mountain, and the entire mountain was consumed in fire and wrapped in these thick layers of smoke. And then from that smoke and fiery mess, The Lord speaks and his voice booms across the plain to the children of Israel. And he starts to share his commandments. I, the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt. And and as the Lord speaks, the children of Israel, they, they shrivel back in fear. They turn to Moses and they say, speak to us yourself and we'll listen. But don't let God speak to us or we will die. That's how afraid they were. So Moses goes up on top of the mountain to speak with God instead. In Exodus chapter 33, we get this moment where Moses is up on top of the mountain, Mount Sinai, with the Lord. And and he requests, Lord, let me see your glory. Now, this is Moses who speaks with the Lord face to face. But he says, let me see your glory. Uh, What he's asking is to see God without any veils on. To see God for who and what he is, with no protection. For instance, if you've ever done that little experiment when there's a solar eclipse, and you know how you take those two pieces of paper and you punch a pinhole in one and you hold it over the other one, and you you look at the paper and, and you can safely see the eclipse as it reflects onto that second piece of paper. Moses is saying, Lord, let me see you without any paper trick. Let me see you without any sunglasses on, face to face. God says to Moses, no one can see me and live. But I tell you what, there's a crack in the rock over here. And as I pass by in all of my glory, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you in the crack of the rock. And I'm going to cover you with my hand so you're protected from my glory. And then as I pass by, I'm going to remove my hand so you can, you can see the afterglow of God's glory. And that's what the Lord does. Wouldn't it be neat for us to see God? In all of his glory. Wouldn't it be neat for us, for for all the different ideas about who God is and what God is, to finally be put to rest? Because there's a lot of ideas out there today. A growing number of people that don't believe that God even exists. Some people believe that God is a, a female and not a male. Some people talk about about God as as if he is is creation and nature, that we're all a part of God and God is in us and, and nature is God. Why doesn't God just show himself for who and what he is? Why doesn't God just lay all those doubts to rest once and for all? Well, Moses has the answer for us. No one can see God and live The book of Hebrews says, our God is a consuming fire. And creation, which is cursed by sin, 
human beings who are cursed by sin? Or we're just dry tinder. When we're exposed to God's glory, God's holiness, God's deity, we'll just combust into flame. We will be destroyed. You see, it is for our protection that God has stepped back from his creation. It is for our protection that God hides himself or veils himself so that people can't see him. And in this act, we see just an afterglow of God's love for us. That he wants to protect sinful humans from himself. He would press us into the cave in the rock and cover us with his hand. A hymn writer once used that image in his line from the hymn. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Hide me in the rock from you, O God. Well, because God is kind of removed from his creation in this sense, he's hidden, some people mistakenly take that as apathy. They believe that God exists, that God is real, but they see God as as a God that's kind of cold and distant, a God who's in heaven while I'm here, a God who's not really concerned with my troubles, my cares, the concerns and the burdens I carry every day. If he cared, why wouldn't he be closer to me? Why can't I hear him? To answer this question, we get to go to the second mountaintop experience of God with the prophet Elijah. 500 years after Moses, God had settled the Israelites in the promised land, and they were being ruled by kings. But these kings were often swayed by public opinion. And and rather than keeping worship of the one true God out in the forefront, they, they brought in all these other false religions. And so in response to this, God sends the prophet Elijah to go to proclaim to both king all the way at the top to the, the ordinary everyday people down at the bottom. The, he was there to proclaim the name of the Lord, uh, to show God for who he was. And because of this, Elijah was very unpopular. In fact, when we meet him in 1 Corinthians, 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah has a death sentence on him. Queen Jezebel from Israel has ordered his immediate execution. And so Elijah is running for his life. Finally, Elijah just throws up his hands and he says, Lord, I don't see the point anymore. I don't see the point in the struggle. I don't see the fruit of my labor. Lord, just... Take my life now because it's not worth it. In Elijah's lowest moment, the angel of the Lord appears to him, touches him on the shoulder, gives him food to eat, and tells him to go to Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, where he's going to meet the Lord. And then in a cave, after a 40-day journey, he's, he's in a cave where, where the Lord is going to come to him personally. And Elijah has this really unique experience. God first sends this this great hurricane of a wind, a wind so strong it's cracking rocks and crumbling the stones. But we're told God was not in the wind. Next, there came a terrible earthquake that shook the, the mountain, but God was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a a raging fire, but God was not in the fire. And after the fire came a still, small voice, a gentle whisper, and that's where Elijah met the Lord. The Lord was in the whisper, the still, small voice. Aha, people say, that's it. That's where we find God, in the still, small voice we hear in creation, or the still, small voice inside my heart. And and that's not what the Lord is teaching us here. 
As we look at these verses with Elijah compared with the rest of Scripture, every time God appears, every time God makes some kind of an appearance, it, it always instills fear and terror. But here is God coming in this still small voice to someone in their lowest moment to comfort and console. And that's true for us too. In our lives, in our lowest moments, moments where we wrestle with sin, moments where we're just entangled with despair, Moments, or maybe we've even felt, my life isn't worth living, Lord. I, my life would be better off if I wasn't in the world. It's in these moments. The moments when we're crushed by, by life, and we're crushed by despair, and we're crushed, crushed by the, the awesome majesty of God, that, that God comes to us in this, this gentle whisper. Another hymn writer referred to this moment in in Scripture when he says, Come not in terrors as the King of kings, but good and gentle with healing in your wings. Tears for all woe, a heart for all distress. O friend of sinners, come, abide with me. Both of these pictures, Moses seeing God in his awesome glory, Elijah seeing God in his absolute humility, are perfectly fulfilled in our third mountaintop experience with Jesus. Jesus, who is radiating all the glory of the true God from heaven, As a father's own voice testifies, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Yet Jesus, who is also God in the flesh, God who is perfectly approachable, God who who comes to help us in our moments of distress, in our moments of sin. Uh, John, who was there on the mountaintop, says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Peter hones in on on the Father's words when he says, this is my son whom whom I love, listen to him. Peter, those, those verses we read from Peter's second letter, says, we have the word of God made more certain and you would do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place. And what Peter is, is teaching us, where do we find God? We find him in the word. It's in those pages of scripture that we see God's glory. The pages of scripture where we hear that still small voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts. But in all of this, Jesus doesn't leave us with just a a picture of him in radiant glory. He doesn't want to leave us with, with himself in this picture with Moses and Elijah standing at either side. But in their moment of terror, when the disciples are afraid, Jesus comes to them, puts his hand on their shoulder, says, don't be afraid. They look up, they see only Jesus. Simple, plain, and ordinary. See, his his moment of greatest glory was on another mountaintop, where instead of being transfigured by light, he's transfigured and hidden in darkness. Instead of having these two great heroes standing on either side, Moses and Elijah, he has two criminals hanging on either side. It is on Mount Calvary where we see the perfect combination of God and his majesty and even wrath against sin and God in his love for the sinner. These two forces come crashing together in Jesus hanging on the cross, his still small voice, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here's where we see God in his glory. Here's where we, we, we say with the hymn writer, come not in terrors as a king of kings, but kind and gentle with healing in your wings. 
This is where we find the rock of ages cleft for me, the, the, the place where the sinner finds safety from the God of creation in the wounds of Jesus. This is a place where we look at our Savior on the cross and we sing that beautiful hymn verse. Beautiful Savior, King of creation, Son of God and Son of man, truly I'd love thee, truly I'd serve thee, light of my life. My Lord, my crown. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen.